So I want to give you a little bit of background about why I became involved in research in wintertime. Um, my, my PhD work years ago was comparison of behaviors of aquatic insects in Appalachian streams with behaviors in the Rocky Mountains, basically the Beartooth Mountains above tree level. So pretty high up on the tops of the mountain. Cold water habitat in summertime and covered over in snow in the winter. My first position was at the University of Kansas. And we got there in August of 1980. It was the first of 14 100 degree plus days. And I was not ready for that. So I said, OK, what am I going to do? I think I'll learn about winter dynamics of aquatic insects. <laughs> <laughs> and that started um, December 1980 and has continued to today. So, um, and it has been a very productive research area. Um, there are quite a few undescribed species of aquatic insects that are active in the winter time. And of course, if they're undescribed, we really don't know much about their biology. And their biology relates to trout in the sense of, you know, they serve as an overwintering food resource for the trout. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what we found and focus mostly on um, true flies that are active in the winter time. Bruce showed you a couple of flies that actually are tied to mimic the flies. And I want to tell you a little bit about their biology. But in addition to the, to the true flies, there are stone flies. I know probably most of you have seen stone flies. That we started encountering them about two weeks ago in the streams that we're working in. And I'm sure the graduate students are finding them on snow today as we speak. And then there are a couple of caddis flies that are active in the winter time. And um, uh, they're quite large, and practice centrist being one of them and serve as um, you know, the food resource also for trout. But what we've been working on primarily is one species that's common and easy to find on the snow in the winter. This, the species name is um, Dionysa mendoti. It was described from streams around Lake Mendoty over near the campus of the University of Wisconsin many, many decades ago and we described by Dean. And um, the biology of the immatures and the biology of the adult was really pretty much unknown. Um, and when encountered in the wintertime, we often see them you know, on the snow, walking around, mating. And, um, and flying at air temperatures which are well below freezing. And most insects don't do this. Pretty atypical, pretty unheard of for summer emerging insects to be flying at temperatures below about 9 degrees centigrade, so about 48 or so Fahrenheit. Yet in the winter time, they're able to walk around on the snow at often temperatures down to minus 7 or minus 8 centigrade. So about down to about 12 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty active. And they're pretty easy to collect. We talked a little bit about earlier about ways in which you can collect them. And we collect them on the snow. But we also, in some uh, instances, can use emergence traps in the winter and collect them as they metamorphose from the aquatic stages to the adult stages. They're captured in the tent, and we can go in and collect them from the tent. So we know um, when they have emerged. And what we're really trying to understand is a little bit more about their reproductive biology. Because for the, for the species to be effective reproducing, they have to secure the mate. They have to mate, and then the female has to fly back to the stream and overposit her eggs. So how do they actually do this? Um, And if we go back to 1980, when I first started working on these aquatic insects, almost 40 years ago now, well, it's hard to believe. Um, at that time, 
uh, the, the notes that were in the scientific literature really kind of, um, the impression that when people encountered them was that these are just isolated instances of an insect that's kind of out of synchrony. It's, it's not in synchrony with the rest of the individuals and it's, it's growing a little quickly. It emerges in the wintertime into very hostile conditions and probably freezes to death. So very little consequence ecologically if you think of them as, as being just out of synchrony with others that are part of the population that probably emerge in the winter. So that was the idea. But what we kept finding was large numbers of individuals on the snow and, and like I said, mating and flying at unusual temperatures. So this suggested that maybe they really are adapted to wintertime emergence and have a life cycle that's tuned to um, cold weather. So, if that's the case, we set out to ask a couple questions, you know, do they really live in a specialized habitat? Yes, we know now they live in trout streams that are groundwater dominated and do not freeze in the wintertime. Do they have a special <coughs> timing of their life cycle? And I'll show you some information about that. Do they have special physiology? How do they keep from freezing? And combined with that, do they have any other kinds of behaviors that are really specialized and help them to survive in the wintertime? I'm going to take a graph and turn it on upside down because <laughs> that's the way I think of the world uh, <laughs> in some ways. But this is Bruce's graph turned the other way around. It. And, and basically what we're showing here is stream temperature and the accumulation of, of temperature in terms of degree days on an annual basis, starting in January and ending in December. And the red is, is a surface water dominated stream that freezes in the summertime, or freezes in the wintertime. And the blue is the groundwater dominated stream. So most, when we think about you know, summer dynamics or trout fishing during summer seasons. We're usually talking about this time of the year. And you'd be looking for streams that are cold, cold water streams, basically is the way the DNR refers to them in their, in their um, regulations and rules. So you'd be looking for those cold water streams. But what's really important is that in the winter time, the temperatures in groundwater dominated streams are warmer. They're not freezing, we've already talked a little bit about that. And these <coughs> insects are emerging during those periods of time. Many of them do not grow and emerge during summertime. So you probably wouldn't be using some of these winter flies, obviously in the summer <coughs> they want to be successful hatching, you know, matching the hatch and, and catching um, uh, trout. So a little bit about the the emergence phenology. And what we've done here is we, we go out on a regular basis and we collect what are called pupil exuvi, translating that into fishing language. I think <coughs> the term is shock, the shock. Are you familiar with that? And you know, if you go out there and you're uh, fishing a shock and you don't set the hook, you say, ah, shucks. <laughs> well, what we do is when we go out there and we see these exuvi, these shucks accumulated, we say, Ah, shucks! And there they are. It, it, it enables us to quickly collect information about what is emerging. And we, in this graph, we accumulated through the winter time the um, totals for the numbers of shucks collected in a quantitative manner, and we plotted versus water temperature. And what you can see is that in uh, the years that are reported here is 96% of the emergence of Dionysa mendoti occurs when water temperatures are 10.1 degrees or less. So I guess they have a very special kind of phenology. They're adapted to those colder times of the year. Well, what about their growth? Well, I challenged a graduate student years ago to put together chambers where we could actually collect the adults, and then we could take them back into the lab, let them 
produce eggs and place the egg masses back in these chambers. The chambers had sterilized rocks that were taken out of the stream, brushed and sterilized, put back in. And the chambers were set up so that water could flow through them, but the screen, the mesh size, was small enough that it would not enable aquatic insects to move into the, to the um, chambers. So we placed the eggs back in the chambers, and he repeatedly pulled rocks out of the chambers on a weekly basis to try to reconstruct the growth patterns of Dionysum and Dodi. As immatures, we know there's four different molds, and in some instances, um, the, the molds, the period of time between molds, is relatively short, at least in the stream that he was working in. And they can go then through a generation, his predictions were that in 63 to 91 days. Basically, they start growing in about October, when stream temperatures drop below about 10 degrees centigrade. And by Christmas, we have one completed generation. And they emerge as adults. And then, those adults mate, the females lay eggs, they go and produce a second generation. And in some of our streams, they're really groundwater dominated. We think they can actually complete three generations in the winter time. And, and this is important because if you think of back to what Bruce said with the groundwater dominated streams, the abundances of aquatic insects at any point in time are about 8,000 per square meter. But those 8,000 per square meter are completing their life cycle and reproducing and completing even more generations per year. So rather than you know, thinking there's one generation and there's one amount of food available for the trout, it appears that in some of our streams there may be three times as much biomass available or food available for the trout to feed on based on what we now know about the life cycle of this species. So that tells you a little bit about the immature stages, what, what's going on underwater. Now I want to talk about the adults because what the adults do is absolutely fascinating. One of the things we've been able to do is use a technique where we can take individual flies and you hold them by the wings and you attach a thermocouple to them. And this thermocouple feeds back to a computer and it records the temperature of the fly um, three times a minute. So a pretty good resolution of the temperature of the fly. We can place the flies in styrofoam containers that then are placed in a minus 80 freezer and the styrofoam insulates the flies so that their, the temperature inside decreases at one degree per minute. And the flies are attached to the thermocouple. The thermocouple is giving three readings per minute back to the computer as they're cooling. When they freeze, so when the water in their body freezes, it's an exothermic reaction. What happens is the, the water molecules turn from <coughs> liquid to crystal and they give off a little bit of heat. And the probe is sensitive enough to um, record that heat that's given off when the water freezes. So we can follow their temperature as they cool and then we get a little blip, about two to one and a half to maybe 1.8 degrees and then they continue to cool. And that little blip tells us the temperature at which they freeze. And we now know that they can supercool to minus 20 degrees centigrade. And we also know that until they freeze, they can survive fairly well at the low temperatures. Not all of them are surviving down to, say, minus 18, minus 19 but a lot of them are. And what this means is that if you think about Wednesday this week, where what was the overnight low, zero Fahrenheit, it didn't kill, it didn't kill a large number of them at least. So um, they have the ability 
to depress the freezing point. We're trying to un better understand how they do this. It's probably a chemical similar to ethylene glycol, which is what we put in the car. It's not that that will be toxic to them. But there are some polyhydrate, there, there are similar, similar chemicals that they can synthesize and incorporate into their, you know, into their, you know, their blood. And um, it's, it's likely to be a polyhydrate alcohol that they're using to depress the freezing point. So a fairly specialized um, physiology in that sense. Another thing that's really kind of neat is we can um, we can estimate the number of eggs that females produce when they oviposit in the lab because they oviposit in the vials. We'll give you vials if you want to take vials with you today. They can oviposit in the vials, and we can photograph them and count the number of eggs. And I'm just going to, just curiosity sake, show you what these photographs look like. But these are eggs with the developing larvae um, in the photograph. And then over here, on this photograph, we have larvae that have hatched. And this is the first <coughs> stage in the life cycle. And here's the chorion of the egg of an insect. Not many people actually get to see that. So <laughs> um, I was really pleased when my photographs came out uh, showing this degree of resolution. Um, so we can estimate with one egg laying bout the, the numbers of potential larvae that will reappear in the stream. And in some of the females that are um, ovipot that we're collecting and are ovipositing in the lab, they're they're um, producing anywhere from six to seven hundred eggs. So it's it's quite a large amount of um, egg production in the winter time in that really small fly. You're right. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit more about um, their uh, life cycle as adults. Most coronamids are thought to be um, short-lived, maybe two to three days, and then they pretty much die. They don't feed as adults. All the energy and nutrients that they require as adults, they need to store up when they're larvae living in the stream. But what we have found with the winter emerging species is that 50% uh, of them live when incubated at 6 degrees centigrade, which is well above what they can survive, live about 18.6 days. And we're trying to better understand why that's the case. We think that part of it is, part of why they live so long, why they have evolved that, is that if you're emerging in the winter time and you're out there on the snow trying to secure a mate, the, the chances of Finding a mate may be relatively small on some days because they just kind of walk around and encounter and then, then mate. And if they can actually live longer, they have more days or more opportunities to actually find a mate and then successfully mate and, and produce, you know, for, for females, fly back to the stream and, and produce um, the next generation. One other thing that's really interesting in terms of the way they oviposit or the way they produce the eggs in the lab. What we've done here is we've graphed you know, the number of females in some experiments that have oviposited within a certain time of period from when we collect them in the field. So if we collect females and um, basically in this experiment, a large number of them actually oviposit within three days of collecting. And then a smaller number, four to seven, seven, eight to eleven, and it keeps going down. But all of a sudden, it pops back up again. And what we see is that here we have um, females that have been in the lab for twelve to fifteen days, and they haven't oviposited. So maybe they didn't mate before we collected them, and now as they're aging. They're simply just you know, ovipositing egg masses because their physiology is failing. If, if that were the case, then we would expect that those eggs would not be fertile, they wouldn't produce larvae. But many of these 
egg masses of 12 to 15 day old females produce larvae. So we believe, and we need to do these experiments, we believe it's possible that they can reproduce without mating. This Parthenote's concept is called parthenogenesis, and we know this occurs in some other groups of insects, but it's not known for winter emerging insects. But we, we do think that you know, there's really basically two ways in which they can reproduce. If they made it before we collect them, they produce eggs that um, have been fertilized. If they haven't made it, they wait around a few days and then they simply start producing eggs without the input of you know, um, sperm uh, from the male. In many instances across insects, when parthenogenesis occurs, so when unfertilized eggs um, can produce a next generation, in many cases they tend to be mostly females. And sometimes when we're in the field in the winter time, we encounter large numbers of females. So once again, we need to do you know, some more quantitative testing, but once again, maybe some indication that there's at least one generation in possibly that could be a parthenogenetic generation in our streams. So this is kind of exciting. Um, here's my summary. You know, we do think that there are really specialized insects. There's about 35 species actually in Minnesota. We've only worked with Mendoti because it's really easy to work with. It's kind of like our our white rat. You know, every scientist has it's a, that's their own white rat. I don't know. Um, and we can encounter them regularly. We can collect them. We can manage them. We now know a lot about them. Um, and the adults. You know, in terms of phenology, yes, it's specialized. Um, possibly two generations or maybe even three generations per year. They disappear in the summertime. We don't see them. We don't capture them. And um, they're relatively long-lived. Long and they can um, mate, fly, and lay eggs at air temperatures below zero. So this is pretty exciting if you're an entomologist. If you're a fly fishing person, what are some of the take home messages? Um, match the hatch, okay. Number one. <laughs> Number two, um, there's probably in some of our streams in the southeast where they're um, really productive in terms of fast growth rates and high abundances of trout, they tend to be the most cold water tempered streams in the southeast. And those are the streams where we're getting two and three possible generations of these aquatic insects. So, so the big picture is that you know groundwater clearly um, can influence, at least we think, this, the abundances and growth rates of the trout. And some of the publications earlier on, I think, argue this more effectively than I am today. <laughs> Um, but there is that linkage between groundwater and the biology of these insects and the fish that you might catch. So, any questions about what I said? Um, yeah. Do you ever find Mendoti that are wingless? I'm sorry? That are Do you ever find Mendoti <coughs> that are wingless? Ah, no we don't. However, in the Rocky Mountains, there's another species, Dionysa leona, that is and another scientist, colleague of mine, is now deceased that he worked pretty extensively on Leona. But basically what Leona does is in low elevations and in the fall when it's emerging, it's fully winged, but generations through the winter, um, they emerge as wingless in the winter time. And, and we have some egg mass estimates for them. And the winged form produces about 200 eggs for female over position and the wingless form in midwinter about 800. So they're trading wings for eggs in terms of the owner. Yeah, I was just on that. I uh, was collecting yesterday and I found, I for the first time, I found a little uh, wingless uh, caddis. Yeah. I've got to say, it's, it's uh, yeah. uh, 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 <coughs> Philippa Tamas. 
We do find some, some crane flies in wintertime, the genus Kyanea, that are wingless and they're walking around on the snow, but their larvae are not living in the stream. The adults might, you know, if they get blown into the stream, they serve as food, but they're often walking around on the snow. So. It's okay. <coughs> okay. No. I'm just going to ask if you find a development of the individuals within each of those winter generations is really highly synchronous. They're all coming along at the same rate, or is there quite um, a bit of variability? Yeah. Well, when we did the experiments with the chambers, they were fairly synchronized in terms of their emergences coming out of the chambers. If you think about a broader stretch of stream where you're going from areas where there's a lot of groundwater coming into where there's not. The thermal regimes are different, so over those longer stretches it's chaotic <laughs> in terms of emergence. But at specific points, yes, it's pretty predictable. And we can and we have been able to calculate the, the three days to try to predict when they're emerging. So you, you talk about the parthenogenic, potential parthenogenic. Have you ever done sex ratio on males and females in the population? We have those data, yes. Um, this year's kind of been an interesting one, so we started working in, in early December. December 8th was the first time that we were doing large numbers, and it was almost exclusively males on that day. But um, on, the, on the last two sample events, it's been about 50-50 male-female. But some other streams than the ones we're working in this year, like Trout Brook down around Cannon Falls, um, yeah, in midwinter it's females, by overrepresented, 80% females sometimes. 